Welcome to In Him with Pastor Dan Wormuth of Joplin Family Worship Center, located on East 7th Street in Joplin, where they are passionate about sharing the freedom and forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. Now, here's Pastor Dan with this week's edition of In Him. Number one, I want to ask you to think about this practical function of the glory in your life. It's in your it's a revelation of your relationship with God. Our relationship with God is an expression of the glory of the Lord because of what we've talked about today. Number one, in our relationship with God, I want you to think about how your life, your personal relationship with Jesus your personal relationship with the Father. He so loved us, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. There must be glory involved in the not perish, but have everlasting life. So I want to begin with this one. There's glory in the relationship you and I have with God. Would you just ask your neighbor, glory in the relationship you have with God. Tell them glory in it. What does that mean, glory in it? That means get in the midst of the splendor of it. I heard you today when you were worshiping. I heard it in prayers today. I heard, I heard the glory of the Lord causing people to leak. With water coming down their face. I, I saw it. I heard it. Number two. The righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. In, in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, Romans 6, 4, Hebrews 1 and 3, we see the revelation of the glory of God in the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus that's now in you. Is there anyone here born again? So there's only two kinds of people here today. Those who are saved and those about to be saved. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's where I set my faith today. I want you to know that there's a righteousness that comes from the glory of the Lord. The Lord, the righteousness of God imputed. And it was in Christ Jesus. And then Christ Jesus paid the price. So we are given the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. We literally are experiencing a measure of the glory of the Lord in that we are made righteous. What is made righteous? It means no longer sin conscious but righteousness conscious. Another word, identity. If you know whose you are, then you understand you are righteous. But what about when I mess up? Get back to him who imputes righteousness. There is an expression of the revealed glory of God. Number three, look at it with me. I want to ask you to consider this. A rest in your soul. I'm going to have to read it because someone here needs to hear this word. Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Mm. Let's look at verse 28. In the Amplified, it says it this way. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened. And I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. (laughs) Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest and relief and ease and refreshment and recreation. Recreation is how I want to pronounce it. And blessed quiet for your souls. That's the glory of the Lord being revealed. For my yoke is wholesome, useful, good, not harsh or hard or sharp or pressing, but comfortable, gracious, and pleasant. And my burden is light and easy to be born. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because the Lord's carrying the weight of it. When he says, come and take my yoke, he's saying, be yoked up with me. Um, I need a helper. 
Uh, um, Jojo, come and help me real quick, would you? So hurry, because it's fun to pick on you, and I've not had to pay you for it like I had to my other boys. So, um, all right. So I'm going to put my arm like this. Put your arm around my, on, on top of me. Okay. So we have a lot to do, and Jesus says, "Come, be yoked with me." Jojo's going to be me and you, and I'm going to just stand in the position of Jesus. So wherever we're going, Jojo does not feel the burden of the weight. Jesus is carrying the weight. Jesus is pulling it. Jesus is taking care of this. He asked us to learn how to walk in step. So do you see how we're learning how to walk in step? Okay, now watch this. We're going to even use the same footing. Ready? Start with left. Ready? So left, right. Jesus is teaching us how to walk in step and time with him. And he pulls the weight because he's the only one that could. Even on the cross, it marred him to such a degree, he was literally unrecognizable. And if you and I had to carry that weight again today, we would be annihilated. So when he says there's a rest for our souls, come and take your rest in me, he's saying, I got this, I'm going to carry this, but you do have to walk beside me, with me. So that you can hear me. You can hear if my heart's pounding. You can, you can hear if my heart is excited for you or for the lost. You can, you can hear if I'm just taking deep breaths and you can align your breath then with mine. And exhale. There's a glory of God to be revealed in your ability to rest in him. That's why God... <laughs> love you, sunshine. That's why God gave us some amazing ministries in the earth to help us find alignment, calibration. That's why I'm so grateful for therapists and counselors and and people in the mental health arena and psychiatrists and psychologists and those who who understand a relationship with the Lord and have the Word of God in their heart and they apply those truths to the earth bringing the soul to rest. For the soul is my mind, it's my will, it's my emotions, it's my memories. Healing my traumas and my my crisis, my pain, my anxieties. Bringing it to rest. Do you see that here? Let's, Let's just move on. Number four, the rejuvenation. There's a practical function of the glory of the Lord to bring rejuvenation in our bodies. I, maybe you've not thought about this before, but as I was just seeking the Lord, I can tell you there is a rejuvenation for your body. In fact, this morning I was just, you know, leaning in on the, the worship and worshiping the Lord. And I reached up my hand. And I said, Oh, look at that hand it's getting old. And I heard the Holy Spirit on the inside said, that's not who you are. The tent's just worn, but you're young. Those age spots don't define me. Those freckles from the sun do not determine who I am. The gray is not what defines me. I am already. I am a son before the Lord. I am already living with eternity in my heart. I am born anew. One translation says, born again. Another translation says, I'm already a a citizen of the kingdom and a creature of eternity. So as long as you look at the exterior, you will, with your mental capacities, start writing off the possibilities. I'm going to try to help, help you as the Lord is helping me. If you look at your body and say, you're getting old. What you will do is say, oh, and so I'm less of capacity for the purposes of God. Now, I know the Lord did not take stripes on his back so that I could waller in feeling older. And what is old? Methuselah. Oh, you can't throw him up there, Pastor Dan. He was the one and only oldest. There were generations of people living within 100 or 200 years of his 900 plus years. I saw an article just this week of a documented individual who they say had lived to be over 200 years old. 
Now, they didn't get there because they were eating McDonald's and they've already passed away just about 50 years ago, but they have documented when they were born. And there were people who were living 100, 120, 140, 160, 170, 180, up to 200 years old. And I thought to myself, they didn't get that old by looking at how old they were and saying, I'm about to go any day now. There's a rejuvenation of the body that the Lord wants you to know you have a right to. Pastor Dan, but I'm going to have to give up this body. Yes, indeed. I look forward to a brand new body. But if I allow my body now to determine who I am, then the glory will become diminished in its purpose in my life. I am a son. You are a son or a daughter of the living God. And you must live like you are a member of eternity now. And I'll get a new body, praise the Lord. But until then, this one has a right to healing because Jesus took stripes on his back. Is, Is there anybody who's ever had a healing in your body? That's rejuvenation. Is there anybody here who woke up one morning knowing that there was a fresh step in your walk? There was, there was just something going on. You, you knew the Lord was at work in your life. Listen, I don't want to tell you testimony, but I got to tell some of it. Brother David was just telling me he went to pray for his brother-in-law. He went to pray for his brother-in-law. His, his, you know, his, was it your sister then? called him and said, he's about to go any minute, any hour, just within this hour, go and pray for him. And he'll tell you the testimony, but I want you to understand something. When the doctors say it's done and the nurses are just writing out the the death certificate information, waiting for the doctor to sign it. Don't undercut. Don't. (laughs) My next words are tongues. And so I don't know if you'd understand them. I'm trying to, are you hearing me? Do not rule out the possibility of the glory of the Lord. Because Brother Peterson had been studying what God was doing in men and women's lives in the earth. And he was seeing the miracles that are being done. And the testimony of what God has done was so strong and filling him. He just said, I'm going to go and I'm going to pray. And when they normally wouldn't have let anybody else to go in there, they let him in there. And when they were just, they were, you know, all the things he would have had to have done. It was an incurable disease. Philadelphia leukemia, is that what you said? An incurable disease. But he laid his hand hands on him and he allowed the glory of the Lord that's on the inside of him to be transferred into a body that was frail and dying and he proclaimed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and it released the glory of the Lord to be manifest why because as long as there's breath in that body and even afterwards I see people being raised from the dead. There's an opportunity for the glory of the Lord to be seen among the people of God. I haven't even gotten to the miracle part yet, y'all. You're getting excited. He prayed. He released the glory. People were uncomfortable with how he got a hold of heaven, or should I say how heaven got a hold of the man in the bed. Because when you and I go knowing that the glory of the Lord resides on the inside and it's time for the unveiling of the glory through your life, you just might get a miracle in a brand new liver. You might just get body parts that you've been needing. You might just not die but live and proclaim the glory. You might just run around a building when they said you can't do that with your one lung. Well, one lung, Sister Kathy, can run. I'm just going to ask you to hear me. In that self-same hour, the power did what it was called upon to do. Did you get a call that night or the next day? The next morning he gets a call. It's not a call to say your brother-in-law has passed. It's a call to say your brother-in-law is awake, setting up in the bed. And two days later he went home from his deathbed to his own bed, alive and living because the glory of the Lord will rejuvenate a body. That's why I'm proclaiming over Sister Chapel's body today the rejuvenation 
power and glory of the Lord. It's why I'm speaking it over Peggy Allen today. I declare that the glory of the Lord will rise among us and in them and be revealed. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, David. I told your testimony. I'm sorry. Let me show you got details you can tell later. The glory of God that is in Christ is at work in our mortal bodies, and this is the manifest glory of God in the person of Holy Spirit, to which our installment of resurrection, you who are saved, have a glory on the inside of you that even if your body were to cease to be a good place for your spirit to live, the finality of salvation is you'll have a new body. What do you mean new body? I mean he will change the corrupted body into an incorrupted body. He will find the molecular structure of those individuals who are nothing but dust in the universe and he will bring them back into their brand new state of a new body. That is a glorious hope and I'm telling you, you're already on the last point and I'm not there yet. And that's the rejoicing. Someone say reconciliation. I got to hurry on this one, but I got to tell it to you reconciliation. Look at 2 Corinthians with me for a second. 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 17. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. And the old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. But all things are from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself, received us into favor, brought us into harmony with himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The reconciled have a ministry. Every believer has a ministry. It's the ministry of reconciliation. That by word and deed, we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. David brought his brother-in-law into harmony with the word of God concerning healing when he laid his hands on him and he prayed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and released the glory of the Lord and the, and the power of God into his life and his body came into alignment. Do you know what that tells me? As unable to talk, as his body already decaying, literally before his eyes, he chose not to look with his natural eyes at the condition of the body, but he spoke spirit to spirit, a ministry of reconciliation. And in so doing, his spirit rejuvenated and his soul began to soar and his body came into alignment with it. And that's the part we need to get right. I'm not here to get bodies in alignment with God. I'm here to get spirit and soul in alignment with God. The body will follow. The glory of the Lord resides on the inside of you. Take some time to fan the flame of the worship on, on the altar of your heart. Look to the glory of the Lord setting upon the throne of your heart. Are you surrendered to him? Then his glory is in full view. The reconciliation. Can I tell you a story? In 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5, one of the, one of the sons of, grandsons of Saul, someone will look at your name and say, oh, he's going to tell that story about the cuss head. <laughs> and so David is coming into the land and Shammai comes out and, then, and he starts cussing David. Now at this time, David's got mighty men. Are you hearing me? Mighty men. How mighty? One guy killed 800 with a spear. That's a little bit better than Kung Fu Panda. Did you hear what I just said? K killed 800 with a spear. Over three, uh, another one over 300 with a sword. These are some tough dudes. When they came to him, they were broke, busted, and disgusted. They, they come in shame. They ran to the cave of Adullam. But what can happen when a David begins to mentor men and teach them servant leadership like David Harriman's going to do? What could happen if a man who's really walking through some real struggles and troubles finds himself in the presence of other men who say, I want to learn about servant leadership. What can God do for me and for my family? I'll tell you, these men were mighty men. And so as Shammai uh, was literally running his mouth, David's men said, just give us permission. We cut his head off now. 
All right. We have to look at it because I need you to see what David does. Just go there with me. Um, we'll hurry. Second Samuel chapter uh, 16. We'll start with verse 5. David came to Baharim, a man of the family of the house of Saul, Shimei, son of Gera, came out and he cursed continually as he came. And he cast stones at David. You know, you don't throw stones at giant killers. Look at your neighbor and say, ignorance gone to seed right here. You don't throw stones at giant killers. And Shemir says, he's, he's cursing him. And as he's cursing him, he says, get out, get out, you man of blood. You, you base fellow, you low down, no good for nothing. Are you here? That's what it's saying. And, and so the Lord has avenged upon you all the blood of the house of Saul. He's making a false statement. David honored Saul. David was honorable towards Saul and his son, Jonathan. When the enemies had killed them and cut their heads off and hung their heads on a spike, David and his men risked their lives to go get the heads, take the bodies, and give them proper burial. There's no dishonor. Saul Saul never lost his life at the hand of David. But accusations never are filled with truth. They're intended (laughs) to look if there's any fear left in you. Hmm. So whose stead you have reigned, and the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hands of Absalom. So it's not just a moment where he's saying, you're low down and you are, your hands are bloody with war. Now he's really given a hard time and your own son has risen up against you in rebellion and now he's ruler. Behold the calamity that's upon you because you're a bloody man. An accusation that is not true. Then David's nephew, Abishai, son of Zariah, to the king. Why should this dead dog... You know, there are some folk, when you look at them and you say, why should this dead dog curse my, my lord the king? In other words, in his eyes, he was already dead. And he just needed permission to go act out what he saw in his eyes. Is there anybody here hearing what I'm saying? Is there a man in the house who understands that if someone starts running their mouth against your family, you're going to rise up saying, Lord, give me permission to take this boy out back for a... And the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? If he's cursing because the Lord said to him, curse David, then... Who shall ask? Why have you done so? Why are you coming here asking me if you can go kill this guy? David said to Abishai, he said to all his servants, Behold, my son who was born to me seeks my life. He's talking about Absalom. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm already dealing with some stuff. Pretty major things here. My own own son's trying to kill me. With how much more may this Benjamite do it? The Benjamite can't kill him because he's throwing rocks. Are you hearing me? He's throwing words. He's trying to curse him. Listen to the heart of David. Let him alone. Now I'm prophesying to somebody today. I'm going to ask you to say this out loud. Let him alone. There's somebody who's been speaking against you and, and you want to deal with it by removing its voice. And the, and the word of the Lord through David is let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has bidden, for the Lord has bidden him to do it. What do you mean, Pastor Dan? I mean, listen, the Lord will test to see if there's still anxiety at work in your life. And the dude is doing this, but get this. It may be that the Lord will look on the iniquity done me and will recompense me with good for his cursing this day. I don't know about you, but when you're in the middle of a really tough time, someone trying to take your life, then someone else accusing you. Why is it David could say, it may be that the Lord will look on the iniquity done me and will recompense me with good for his cursing this day. In other words, David said, I know the God that I serve and I'm doing my best to follow him. And in this moment, I'm going to tell you now, But if the Lord hears what he's saying, it's evil. 
It very well could be if I let him alone, he'll get so bad in his cursing that the Lord will have to show up and bless me. This is not a New Testament saint. This is David, though, who has experienced the glory of the Lord in his winning battles against a lion and a bear and Goliath and many other victories that he's had. And the glory of the Lord has held him in check when it needed to. The glory of the Lord in his life has caused him to write song after song after song after song. Look at the dude who says, could it be that if the Lord hears how bad he run in his mouth, that the Lord will have to come and bring good, 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 good to me because of the cursing. I'm going to ask you right now to consider that the Lord might want to do that in your behalf today. Can you turn your heart to the Lord in a way whereby which you would allow the Lord to take care of what's been said against you? I'm living in a time where there's a lot of words being spoken that are not true. And you and I are got to, we got to move beyond how it, how it would trip us up and give somebody permission to go take them out. Could it be the Lord will hear and have had enough of their words and say, I'm going to show you my glory. The last one is rejoicing. Seeing the full glory of God is our ultimate hope. I'm looking forward to seeing him face to face. We rejoice in hope. The, the glory of God, Romans 5, 2. God will present you and me blameless before his presence, the presence of his glory with great joy, according to Jude 24. With great joy we will stand before him. He will make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. Are you hearing me? Which he's prepared beforehand for glory. You've been prepared beforehand for glory. I didn't highlight that one. I don't know if you can even copy that whole paragraph and put it up there for them, for them to see. If that's possible, they might take a picture of it since they've been getting their cameras out. I know they're not taking pictures of me. So... Jesus in all his person and work, in the incarnation and ultimately ultimate revelation of the glory of God, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Father, I desire that they may be with you, or excuse me, that they may be with me where I am to see your glory. John 17, 24. The exodus of someday standing in the presence of God. Jesus is saying to his father, I desire that they will come and be with me. That they can see you as I see you in your glory. Thank you for listening to In Him with Pastor Dan Wormuth of Joplin Family Worship Center. Listen to this broadcast again at KNEO.org. You can also download a podcast version of today's message by searching KNEO on iTunes. Joplin Family Worship Center is located on E7th Street in Joplin and has ministries for all ages. They invite you to join them this week for Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evening service at 7 p.m. Find out more at jfwc.org or facebook.com slash Joplin Family Worship Center. Follow Pastor Dan on Twitter at Daniel H. Wormuth. Thank you for listening. And remember, in Him, you are free. Are you a Christian who likes to read? If not, there's a whole world of Christian publishing out there that you're missing out on. I invite you to check out the Author's Corner podcast where I talk to the latest Christian authors each week about their new book releases and what's coming next. So if you're ready to jumpstart your spiritual growth with the newest books and the authors who write them, check out the Author's Corner podcast with me, Roberta Foster.